Welcome back to another exciting day, Masters LAN. Day two is underway. Myself, Hindu Man, alongside Taco, will be bringing you the action from the desk today and breaking things down for you. Lots of exciting games to go on to. First thing we're going to mention, though, you guys at home can get involved this weekend, well, at least for your own personal accounts, and get three times everything, including fantasy points. And that's going to be the best way for you to party up with a couple of friends, even, or just feel free to solo queue, maybe acquire some boosters of your own, and that's always so much fun being able to acquire three times of everything. I mean, it's also worshippers, not just the fantasy points, but worshippers get those girls to diamond, right? How oh. many diamonds you got now? Ah, uh, way too many to count. Yeah. At, at least uh, 20 or more. Okay, that's not trolling. I'm about like 15-ish or something like that, but 20 is plus is crazy. Not only that, the only thing to mention is Harry's Expo is on its way. A little bit sooner than usual, November 16th to 18th. Usually it's in January, but now in November, we're going to be attending DreamHack. And you can, guys can get your tickets at HiresExpo.com to come and see all the exciting action, not just from Smite. Not just from Smite, and also you get a chance to meet some of the players, meet some of the casters even. It's truly just an awesome time being able to explore a bunch of different gaming environments. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun for you guys to come and see us live. With that, though, it's time to move on to what exactly is going to be happening here today. Let's have a little look at the brackets and show you what happened on day one. We got to see the international teams take on the best from Europe and North America, and we get to see some exciting games today. That's going to be the lower half of the day, the round two matches you can see there, rival versus United and Dig up against Space Station. But this is how we're starting things off, Taco. And Mashu Boys and Nocturnes Gaming. And then, of course, we're going to see the other side of the spectrum with the other international teams. We are Inserno and Black Dragons. And I think that Nocturnes Gaming and Black Dragons are probably two of the teams that I want to highlight here because I, I think that these guys probably have the most experience out of all the sure. international teams. And I also think that they were by far the most impressive during yesterday's sets. I think a lot of people at home will be looking at that going, well, let's see. Because the one talk I do want to mention is that EU are kind of confident coming into that today <laughs> after watching the performances yesterday. Like the European players as a whole kind of went, you know what, EU look better than NA yesterday. But I do feel that's something to do with the international regions because Nocturne's and, of course, Black Dragons, they faced off against North America, and we're talking about them being the more difficult opposition. I, I definitely think that NA had the uh, tougher uh, opposition, and not only that, but Nocturnes as well. I mean, we saw the 50-plus minute slugfest that they had going on against EU United yesterday. I think that if I'm EU United, I'm probably focusing more on trying to clean up my gameplay a little bit. I do feel as though there were certain moments during that first game against Nocturnes where United were kind of shaky, but that's not to take away anything from Nocturnes' performance. I think that Nocturnes also just came out doing a phenomenal job in terms of focusing on their strengths mm. during the drafting phase. Well, Mashu boys yesterday, they got the chance to take on Rival. Today, they're going to open things up against Nocturnes Gaming. How are Mashu boys feeling? We had a chance to catch up with them just before they got themselves set up. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, obviously not the result you wanted yesterday against Rival, but what was the biggest thing you learned from that set? Um, we are not going for the late game strategy this time because uh, we were planning for survive to the late game, but no, that doesn't really work. So we will, in this game, we are going for some more early game pressure and yeah, pick some early game stuff, so. So yesterday you played against uh, Europe, and now today you're going to be playing against Nocturnes. Do you prepare differently for the international teams versus the North American and European teams? Mm, just like what I say, uh, more pressure, <laughs> and yeah, that that's it, pressure. Nocturnes looked pretty good yesterday up against E United. Was there anything that you saw in their game that uh, you want to try and attack, or maybe something that you want to watch out for? Um, watch out for the early game counter because we see them like their countering speed in the start and if they have a really high pressure deal lane they'll just come to the purple so we might pick some really more pressure character in the early so yeah. We saw you yesterday playing through the jungler uh, is that something you're going to continue to do uh, moving forward in the tournament? Um, jungle something. Right. Sorry what? Oh my god. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, we saw yesterday you guys played primarily focusing on the jungle role. Uh, uh, so are you going to continue to do that versus Nocturnes or are you going to look to other players? Uh, I think we're going to focus on other roles. Uh, specifically the dual lane so that they can carry us uh, through the mid game and late game. Yeah. This is some of your first experiences on land, certainly here in America. What was your first set like? Was it what you expected for a land game? 
Mm, uh, can we uh, try to at least win? But we'll, <laughs> we'll try to do he, that. He was very nervous for me specifically. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we might need to record the whole thing again. <laughs> Thank you, fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> hey, what's up, Nocturnes? First of all, welcome back. Yesterday, you guys played against E United. Now, unfortunately, not the result you guys were looking for, but you certainly played really well. What can you sort of take from a set like that as you move on in the tournament? Yeah, we know it was a pretty close set. Um, I mean, the first game was really close. Um, I think we, we throw the game, uh, but we, we got uh, a lot of confidence by, by doing that. So that's good for the next set. Is, is that the, the big takeaway there? It, can you get, it like, what I'm trying to say is that a lot of teams, I think, would, would take a loss like that pretty hard. But even though you, you didn't have the best of game twos, finding confidence in that is the best way to move forward this double elimination bracket. Do you feel like you can still have the potential to to make a run, beat Mashu Boys today, and then go on and beat an SPL team tomorrow? Uh, yes, of course. Like um, it was hard because uh, we had the lead and we could have end the, the game. We didn't, but uh, we played well. We did well against the world champions, and it it was good. So today you play against Mashu Boys, like Ryan mentioned. Uh, let's get into the specifics. When watching the games yesterday, you guys were here in the studio. Was there anything about Mashu Boys play that you saw that you guys are going to look to exploit or uh, or look to play well against? Um, uh, we saw the games. And definitely, I would should uh, say to uh, their solo to not play episode. Uh, and I mean, we think we can win pretty easy today. Are there any big adjustments that you guys feel you need to make after that set against the United? Is the meta kind of what you expected? Anything that you need to change right away? Uh, I think that we need uh, to think more the, the things that we are doing. Like uh, we, it always happened to us that we can't end the game. Like we are having the lead and we can't close the game. Uh, and yeah, that's what we need to improve. And so, looking at Mashu Boys today, how are you going to look to close the game? What are you guys looking to do specifically to improve tonight? Um, try to engage better into Phoenix or Ejectis. Uh, that's it. We have to improve that. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Good yeah, luck. Right, thank you. Thanks, guys. So that's a nice little look at two of the teams that are going to take place today. Just so you guys at home know, Mashu Boys, their representative there was Bill HK and ASU. I was butchering his name yesterday, ASU the Jungler. And of course, Smitero and Beltway from Nocturne's there. Two different different styles there from the two teams. Obviously, it seems like uh, Mashu Boys are just looking to try and find a victory and find some confidence. Nocturne, a little bit disappointed in how their performance went yesterday. I, I don't know if Nocturne were necessarily disappointed. I'm sure that there were aspects that they know that they could have improved on and I, I actually really liked how both Smitero and Beltway said that they were uh, actually motivated even more so after their set yesterday. Sure. I think that that's really fantastic because they should be after that performance in game one especially. I know that game two was a bit more of a flounder for them but Definitely. that's always bound to happen I think in that sort of situation and I, I think that overall Nocturnes in the pregame interviews at least seem to display a little bit more confidence in the way that they compose themselves even mm. in comparison to Mashu Boys. So I, I think that for Mashu Boys, this is going to be a pretty critical set, whether they win or lose, because if anything, I, I think that this LAN experience is just going to build more into their player self-esteem and self-confidence. Completely agree. I mean, Conwak, coach of Mashu Boys, he was talking yesterday a little bit, saying little LAN experience with this team, and they also have two substitutes here as well. Unfortunately, you know, visas to the States have caused a couple of issues for some of the Southeast Asian teams before. So that's where they're struggling. Whereas Nocturne gaming i was speaking to their owner a little bit earlier on he said their biggest issue they've really got is they need a coach more than anything else they don't have the coach in the year to really understand the game at a technical level to help out their boys a little bit more and obviously the one thing they focused on was picks and bands is where they feel like they struggle more so as we go into them now Hopefully they can get some corrections for this one. I would love to see Nocturnes with a, a proper coach to be picked up. So for anybody that's watching the broadcast right now, that's certainly something to keep in mind if you are a, a high-level player that thinks that you have the skill and knowledge to 
help coordinate this team a little bit better. But even still, all things considered, I think that their AOE control comp from yesterday is really the play style that they should try and stick to. Definitely. I think that Smithero did a great job alongside Inuito, and they both seem to really just feed off of each other so heavily. Big one then for these two teams. Winner advances on in the tournament. The loser goes home. It is a best of three after all. Mashu boys with the second pick will ban away the Achilles this time round. Nocturnes, the only roster change they've made recently. Ada Holder, Ada Holder sorry, joined this team as Noz Q went out. That was a bit of a surprise, I, I think, for a lot of people. Nozki is uh, certainly a player who he, has shown his stuff yeah. in the past and has certainly had his moments where I, I think a lot of us, in, myself included, have been impressed. But I, I have no no faults with Adair's gameplay from yesterday. I think that he did an excellent job really How utilizing do you say his, name? his team. Adair? I could not say I, that name. There's no <laughs> way. I'm not even going to Well, try. people get mad at me for saying the Latin players' names in a Spanish accent because... Okay. You know. Well, Taco at the moment, I mean, Terra got through. We've not seen any Terra really so far this tournament. It was Nemesis and all banned out by uh, Nocturnes. And then Mashu Boys banned out the Giannis and Achilles, which leaves this Terra available. Flexible, or is it mainly for the support role these days? I would prefer to see Nocturnes take Terra towards the support role. I think with the removal of her global ultimate, she's usually better off as a support player because having the Earth and Fury in team fights is going to be a lot more useful as opposed to having to wait for a rotation out of the solo lane. Well, Kakulin for the solo lane for Mashu boys here today. We'll see how this works out for Bill HK. He's one of the substitutes for Mashu as part of the interview. He's going to have a come. tough task, but Cerberus also locked in. Cerberus versus Terra, definitely an interesting matchup in the dual lane by the looks of it. it. It could be a spicy one, but I would probably still have to favor Terra in that matchup. And Just wave clear advantage, is that? I mean, the level one is definitely Cerberus, is that right? I would have to assume, but I think that once Terra starts building around like the level three and up, I think she starts to have a little bit more weight lane control. Sure. So it's mostly going to be Nocturnes having to protect their solo lane uh, blue buff. I, I think that making sure that whether it's Terra or Sobek in that solo lane, you just got to make sure that you're securing that blue so that way they're not being limited on their mana cost. Really. It's funny because when you look at what happened with Nocturne yesterday, they in the interview were talking about they need to learn to end games, whereas Mashu were like, we need early pressure. Have they got enough early pressure enough with now the Agni locked in too? Yes and no. It, it all really just depends. I, I think I'm more concerned about the execution right now from Mashu Boy's composition in comparison to Nocturnes. I think that Nocturnes have a very sound front line going for them. It's going to be great damage mitigation all around, I think, because of how tanky their lineup is so far. Mm. And Agni, while he does have the potential to help chunk away through some of those protections and things like that, I also feel as though the Agni might get punished in the mid to late game stages because of the Sobek probably being spammed off cooldown and you have to keep in mind that the Terra route as well can really limit some of that mobility from the Agni too. So Mashu Boy is going to ban away some mid laners raw and tough so long range artillery is off the table for Nocturnes this time round whereas Nocturnes focusing towards the jungle knowing that Mashu have Cerberus and Kakula locked in so far they definitely do need a jungler. Where would you aim for jungle for Mashu here? Perhaps a Daji even, mm. really just keep the uh, the AOE control more so in your favor. I think that Nocturnes, we already saw, have displayed plenty of comfor comfort in, in terms of being able to control certain aspects of a team fight. And I think especially being able to limit uh, the routes that are actually going to be viable in terms of survivability away from Mashu Boys is a strong direction for this team to take. Nocturnes with one more ban, and they're just thinking this one through for a while. Obviously, no Hunters picked up from either team just yet, so maybe more focus towards the Hunters isn't necessarily the best idea in the world, unless there's one you don't want them to get a priority pick of. I do like that Hombats ban. That's the one I was really thinking about. If Mashu were looking for some early pressure they've been talking about, trying to get off going early, level 5 Hombats ganks are always dangerous. Well, here's the thing, though. I would not assume pressure anytime I see a Hombats in the jungle. He sure. is a god that does tend to struggle a bit, I think, especially since I'm assuming that that's going to be Smithero on the Raven yet mm. again. And he looked awesome on the Raven yesterday. And I think that this is going to be a, a very strong pickup. I, I'm also assuming that they might be leaning more towards the Hachiman. Even, except Mashu Boys is going to go ahead and take that away from them. Yeah, Hachiman so safe in the lane, Taco, for the most part. I mean, his laning phase is pretty solid, and then he transitions so well throughout the whole game. 
I think that that is by far the best mentality for Mashu boys to go for. I, I think that if they're able to just hang even mm -hmm. during the, the earlier stage of the game, it might build more into their player confidence because that to me seems to be their biggest struggle. I understand that it, it is got to be a bit of a mental blow sure. of dropping a set in 34 minutes flat. Well, you also mentioned, I mean, Mashu boys themselves in the interview mentioned they want to try and play through the dual lane a little bit more and let them transition through to the late game. Maybe that Hachiman Cerberus combo could be that. Nocturnes now looking at Jingwei for themselves as Mashu boys once hovered it. So is the danger of that, right? When you hover a god, it kind of gives the idea to the enemy team, like, oh, I know this god too. We could pick this. Oh, I think that Jingwei would also be a very safe pick here for Nocturnes because Kokolin and Cerberus both are mostly looking for that knock-up in team fights. And Jingwei, having such an easy escape off of her agility, would be the perfect counter-engagement that I think that Nocturnes might want to go for. Well, once upon a time, Jingwei and Terra in the dual lane together were a real difficult thing to deal with. Obviously, the walls crushing you into the knock-up and the follow-up was monumental. Nocturne's maybe gonna look that in for oh, themselves hey, and now hovering over Poseidon as well. The Poseidon pick would be hot and I am loving it. Nocturne's have a, a very sound team composition. I think that this is certainly going to end up playing to their strengths and Maja boys, if they opt for the Kali here, I, I'm, I am going to be a, a little confused because normally when you're trying to shoot for the early game, you wanna yeah. opt for some of that early clear potential. And Kali, while she doesn't necessarily struggle in the jungle, she's not exactly ideal as far as establishing straight up map pressure. Could be a troublesome thing for the Bashu boys this with the Kali, because obviously like the Whirlpool kind of cripples her down, makes she cut, make sure she can't leap away. Although as the game goes on, she gets bonus penetration against some of these tankier targets. I do think, though, that Mashu boys might be falling into this trap because they saw Space Station playing with it yesterday and thinking that this could be the answer. And possibly. On top of that, I really just want them to play towards okay. the Agni strengths. And Kamazot is certainly a pick that I love here. Kamazot's Agni, both are going to work really well together. So that's going to be some of that early clear, some of the early pressure that Mashu boys were talking about. I also think that Kamazot is a great pick here for trying to deal with the Poseidon. You have a lot of dive potential. You have a lot of range potential. That way you can look to limit some of Nocturne's team engagement options. Maybe we see ASU looking for a little bit of baits around the Poseidon and then try and put himself in an awkward position so the Krakens are used on him and he can just ult <laughs> away from that. Could it's a possibility, out, right? it, it, but you have to be careful with the timing on all of that because if, if you slip up in the slightest, Kamazots isn't immune until he's fully in the air and even then still can be uh, some of those finicky moments where he gets caught up in dot damage and the like. Who have you got for game one here, Taco? I am still favoring Nocturne's draft. I think so, too. We'll see how this one plays out, though. Casters are standing by to bring us this first game. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Taco. Finch and Anatoly here to bring you Nocturnes going up against Mashu Boys. And this certainly has all the makings of an excellent set between these two teams here, Toli. You can, <coughs> you can really tell that these teams are already making adjustments from their first day here. Right. Mashu Boys played a little bit passive in the solo lane, and they picked a Sobek there, and getting into Deathwalker's hands, into Ice Ice Baby's Naja Kakolin combination, yeah. they fixed this. Now they're the ones that are going for the aggressive solo jungle combination with the Kakolin and this Kamazon. Well, does that aggression win you over? Mixer Chad, who do you think will win? Please vote for us in the poll. That way we know exactly who you all are behind. I like this draft as well, though, Tolly. I really like putting Adair on this Poseidon if it is indeed going to be him. And, oh, wow. It looks like things are already kicking off. Beltway first blood okay. over Kamiru to get it started for Nocturne's Gaming. Welcome, Mashu boys to playing up against the Ladam teams. It's not going to be easy. I think Nocturnes are a little bit upset about what happened yesterday when they let game number one over Uni and they're not United done. just I don't think slip. They're, they're going to go for Bill HK and take him down too. Wow. Snytero and, and Beldway coming up big for him too of the really strong players from their set up against E United looking strong here too. Without this Sobek pluck, realistically, these two picks almost never really happened to start off the game. So catching Masha Boys in the jungle right around these corners is how you really abuse the Sobek big level one but by getting your pluck you can't really get the lane clear advantage so struggling a level one however bill hk dying so he's not going to have the same kind of gold once beltway gets level three to five those boots are going to be completed and look at the warriors blessing stack differential already wow. one to eight that's 70 seconds worth of stacks well that's going to help a ton for beltway in that solo lane matchup as you can see from our poll nocturnes is 
heavily favored here up against Mashu Boys, and that was before they saw an opening to double kill, essentially, for this Nocturne Gaming squad. So certainly already living up to the hype, but Mashu Boys, we saw it yesterday. Even though the set may have been rough, they certainly have plenty of potential, I think, in this set. They are the ones that came out of the Southeast Asia region. We've seen Rampage play really well. We've seen Kamiru play really well as well. So we'll see how well they can do here on the Agni Hachiman, because they got a lot of work cut out for them. Their team fight is definitely strong if they can make it there. They cannot allow themselves to get under too fast here compared to how Nocturnes started off. So they just need to make sure that they watch out for that so big pluck in these little skirmishes. And they should be A-OK. -okay. They have the setup here, Rampage, having the bomb stunts from a distance. And then they have the burst damage coming from ASU and the uh, Camazots. I'll talk a little bit here. Adair took the Whirlpool as the first ability. And I think that was huge to help out with the squad, with uh, with that those early kills. You know, it does get those ticks to kind of pull you in, make it harder for you to get away. Does nice AOE damage too. So, uh, Adair on this Poseidon. I mean, he played so well for them yesterday, and already helping out with some of these kills early on. Level three now has the red buff and is heading right back in the lane. And sprint was used from Bill trying to avoid that level one death. Wasn't enough. Even the bees from Kamira wasn't enough to get yeah. away from the thick of things here. And that's going to be important to see how Nocturnes takes these two kills and see what they can really transition with it with. Are they going to look to play aggressive in the solo lane since Beltway was the one that also got one kill and the one assist alongside his jungler, Smitero? Heading back over to the dual lane now. Manishiman Kamiru going to be going up against Zion6 and Noi2 Lover. Zion6 is on the Jingwei here, Tolly. And we talked about this earlier. Jingwei not only can, can do fine in lane, probably not going to be able to keep up with the Hachiman, but so safe. The passive, able to bring her back in, has the airstrike for disengage too. So Zion6 shouldn't have too hard a time even against the Hachiman oh, as oh. there's trouble in mid. The dash from Rampage is going to get disrupted because Aider Holder with a nice knockback. Going to save his jungler for the moment. Sprint being used here because the root is coming through. And the stun follows it up and Zion6 is there with all the enhanced that you need. Manishima has to use the sprint of their own in order to back away. So no kills come out, but they end up trading Relic for Relic. Cerberus is one of these gods that you can't take for granted. Has a lot of unexpected burst damage with that paralyzing spit. If you can connect all four of those projectiles. Not done yet, though. Every single time Noitu Lover has that root, will throw it out there onto Kamiro. The double knockoff from Zion6. The agility not going to be used quite yet. Very patient. Not going to go in to play aggressively, but Noitu Lover doing a great job so far in this laning phase. Terra really is so strong right now here. Totally, I mean, I feel like uh, this character in particular was banned out almost every game yesterday. We, we, we barely saw it, if at all. And now we're finally getting to see it be put to good use. And this is why it's such a nightmare. The root sets up so much for the rest of the team. And I'm pretty sure that Terra would have been banned from Masha Boys in this game if it wasn't for the performance of the mid laner, Aider Holder, playing the Giannis last day against E United was right. just fantastic in game number one. And that was forcing the hand from Masha Boys. Like, all right, we saw what you guys can do with the Giannis. We'd rather deal with this Terra. Lincoln, from my Terra, they are going to be able to successfully come on for the invade and cause further problems for Bill HK. You highlighted this earlier on, but he already was behind because of that Warrior's Blessing start and the death. So now with a little bit of attention from Smitero to the solo lane, that's only going to get worse. That's true. Nocturnes are now taking their lead a little bit into a stretch, trying to go for that right side jungle invade. ASU trying to look for a little cheeky invade on the backhand side, but he doesn't have the blink, so he really can't cut the distance. Needs to rely on those long distance bombs from Rampage to set him up. There is going to be okay in the mid lane for now. He's had to play pretty far back. I think he recognized that Rampage was here. Kraken wasn't quite on the mark, but he gets the Aegis out of Rampage all the same. So essentially the same effect is still achieved. Mytero takes a good bit of poke from the rain fire. He's got to retreat now. Very healthy now, but it is a long cooldown now. 165 seconds for Rampage to try to hold on to that one. Whereas the Kraken, only about 90 seconds here. Mage's Blessing not fully evolved, so he doesn't have that 10% cooldown reduction quite yet. Definitely going to be looking to play hyper aggressive against Rampage, especially with the Smitero getting that blink here. Right. It's going to come off cooldown in 50 seconds, and that's the timing window to abuse for Nocturnes. If they can get that sprint, or not the sprint, but the dash as well, that really is what helps set everything up for him. So we'll see how well that ends up going for him later on. We'll talk about that Aegis a little bit, though, or the play we saw there from Adair. I mean, in Rampage's credit, the Kraken does do a lot more damage even on the side now. It doesn't have to necessarily be just the center. So even if maybe the center was off the mark, making sure there was no surprise burst damage from it, 
able to get out of there. Yes, it causes the Aegis, but now Rampage can stick around in lane. And all that damage really adds up there. If it's done from one player, the second player will be able to clean up once the dash is not available. And that's basically playing hand in hand between your jungler and your mid laner, no matter if it's season five, four, or otherwise. That's been normally the tradition of how Smite competitive games need to go. You have to make sure that you rely on your teammates, whether it's offensively or even defensively. Relying on their teammates is what helped Nocturne get very close to that game, man, in, in game one with E United. The game two maybe was not as close, but what was it, like 50 minutes, I want to say, oh, something yeah. like that? The slugfest that they took E United through, and they, they took them all the way up to the brink. Couldn't quite close it out, but they're going to bring that experience here into this set up against Mashu Boys. In fact, they might be waiting now on oh, opportunity. No two lovers, Spike Terra, all here. Trying to go for something here. Going to root out ASU, but he jumps in place, trying to get that heal off but not going to be successful in doing so. And with all that poke there, just on the Kamazots, that could trigger Nocturnes to look to play aggressive. I'm glad we came and checked back in on the soul lane over here, though. It looks like there's still a bit of grouping in the jungle, so AA still may be in some trouble. Goes up into the air. He's very low. Is going to be able to retreat, though, so he'll land back into safety. Nocturnes gaming able to force the bat out of hell, but it does look like... They didn't really have to give much up to make it happen. Holding the Aegis and using the ultimate instead. That's the, the way you really min-max some of your cooldowns sure. there. I like what Bellway tried to do, using that pluck for extra damage, realizing that he wasn't going to get the fatal blow off. So as a result, getting the extra damage. But Bill stealing it at the very last second, securing his own stuff. And this level two advantage here for Beltway is not the typical Guardian no. versus Warrior matchup you're used to seeing at home, folks. This is basically the result of those two early kills from Nocturnes. And it's it, it really is important that you bring that up because this is not part of what makes Sobek great is that he's gonna bully you early on in the solo yeah. lane. Like that's not that's not what you're picking up Sobek for. So that this is just an extra benefit on the Nocturnes gaming make things even easier. That's why we see Smite Taro free to sort of lurk around the mid lane to sort of rotate everywhere else. He knows that solo's fine. In a normal game when there's no pressure in the solo lane and no one dies before the minions spawn, Sobe can eventually start to become the bully once right. he gets some cooldown reduction in the form of Shoes of Focus, you get the Breastplate of Valor, and now with that 30% cooldown reduction, the physical defense between the BOV and the Warrior's Blessing, then that's when the matchup sort of shifts. This is a good response though from Mashu Boys. Not gonna let this blue buff go down for free. Beltway already extremely low. Rain fire gets it done, Mashu Boys. Punish the repeated invade. They're gonna keep going. Kraken slows down Bill HK. He's not gonna be able to keep up the chase. ACO is here. He wants to try and jump over. Pings are coming out. They're letting them know where Adair is at, but they can't quite close the gap. Instead, gonna turn their attention towards Noi2. Lover, who gets controlled by the bombs again. Bill HK finds that kill. Two quick ones for Mashu Boys. Not Nocturne's just staggered one by one. It was a two-man invade on the blue against four defending Mashu members. And then eventually Aider Holder using his ultimate defensively. Couldn't really find anything. And Noitu Lover trying to peel for his mid laner. Staggered too long. And he was going to be that second victim here. And on the board is Mashu boys. Really recognizing where the pressure is going to be coming yes. from and responding to it. That play absolutely had to be made as Rampage has the Aegis Force in mid lane. Smitero overhead kick finds him underneath the tier one tower. Puts down the mid laner for Machu and is able to get a little bit of return love there in the mid lane. But totally, that play over in solo lane that had to happen around the blue buff. Nocturnes had repeatedly been stealing it from Bill HK, and finally, Machu Boy's punished. With a two level advantage, that's basically a deer in the headlights. It's like it was very given that that was the strategy right. that Nocturnes wanted to employ. Machu Boy's read them like a book, responded in kind. And I honestly don't think that even though they died those two times that Nocturnes are going to stop the pressure in the solo lane. I think that it is still going to be a consistent thing to look for with a power spike from Bellway now having so much physical defense. He's going to continue to bully Bill and maybe even find a solo kill if he's not careful enough. Well, that's the side of the map where they certainly still have control. Beltway has a two-level advantage, as does Smitero, so I certainly wouldn't be surprised if we see more action from the solo jungle. As it actually looks like Nocturnes are looking to invade the red buff, ACO is here to try and contest this Rampage as well, so it won't be a free invade from Nocturne's Gaming. The walls are going to be what goes for it, but 
in the end. Looks like they're not going to be able to take that one away. They forced the reset, though, just to waste a little bit of the time coming out of Masha, boys, while Zion6 going back to the dueling. Yeah. Trying to poke out Kamiro here, looking at the two hunters. Getting a lot more stacks, Zion6. Finishing off the Devil Gloves first, sitting about 55 stacks ahead here. Beltway just going to do annoying solo lane things, trying to buy time for Smitero to get in there. Well, you were right. Smitero came up for the blue buff first. The ultimate comes out, but overhead kick. Amuse getting knocked up. He does find it with the Prana Onslaught. Another kill in the solo lane this time. Smitero gets it. 3-0-1 for the jungler. Now, the good thing that I'm really seeing from Smitero is the patience from his overhead kick. Right, really yeah. using it when it matters the most. Waiting over the Aegis in the mid lane, waiting over when the knockup was coming through the Kakulin to immune that, and getting off the damage there. Really knowing when the jump was coming from Kakulin, so he saves his Prada Onslaught for the guaranteed hit. Once the jump is down, once the knockup is down, there's no more disruption. Guaranteed kill and a great use of Beltway's physical defense to absorb all those tower shots to allow Smiteru to clean up. And now you see them earning for themselves a 5,000 experience lead. The gold is about 2,500 as well. So even for the 11-minute mark, this is a pretty good lead that Nocturnes have been able to build for themselves. We don't often see big experience leads over big gold leads, so those level differentials really going to start hurting Mashu boys. It's a lot of the jungle here, honestly. ASU has not been able to keep up. It's a two-level differential and second relic for Smitero already getting the beats here. Stun onto Noitsu Lover. Even the mounted archery from Kamiru thinking that an engagement was about to pop off. And without that ultimate from your Hachiman, if they heard or saw that, Zion 6 should be looking to play aggressive in the duel lane as a result. Zion 6 has a little bit of a lead here over Kamiru. Not too surprising. We see these Jingwings be able to kind of farm those back harpies, I believe, when after that passive. So it's just kind of like free experience she's able to get over her opponent a lot of the time. And sometimes you don't normally want to back in that case where these minions are about to touch each other in the middle of the wave. Right. But because you're Jing Wei, you're just going to get there in the nick of time, so you're not going to really lose anything under your tower. And you were talking about the min-max potential. He wanted to just get that extra 15% attack speed off of the short bow to win some more of these little 1v1 boxing skirmishes. Red buff again is going to be invaded. Adair going to try and get out this time. On the other side, Mashu boys do defend the blue buff spawn this time. So even though they lose red, I think it's because they sent some people over to make sure that blue is controlled and make life a little bit easier for Bill HK. Not going to save that tier one tower, though. The pressure from Beltway just too strong on that side. So the way I look at buffs is it's it all matters on when the current state of the game is, of where these buffs matter the most. Pre 10 minute mark, blue buff matters a lot for a lot of your soul laners trying to spam those abilities, trying to get off more cooldown reduction. Not so much for Bill, considering that he uses rage instead of mana. But red buff, it scales off of your power, whether you're magical or physical. So after the 10 minute mark, once you get a couple of items, that's where it really matters. So I like the fact that Nocturnes are looking at the more important objective, which is the red buff fighting over those mid harpies. Adair does have Rampage inside the Whirlpool, drops the crack, and it gets Aegis, so Rampage is going to be okay, but the Aegis is going to be on cooldown for a while. Manages to avoid the stun as well, but ACL is on the back side. Got to make sure Nocturnes are paying attention. Smitero, though, on the back side as well. He could easily blink in if Rampage is not careful. His dash is about to come off cooldown, so he'll be able to escape yet again, but it's Zion 6 oh, with wow. a lot of lifesteal and a completed Ikavo to start off a 13-minute gold fury. And they recognize that this is happening due to the Mashu boys, so not going to let it go for free. They end up dropping it and instead going to look for the fight. They do not have the Kraken here, though. One of their big mage ultimate stun hits two members, and they got plenty of bursts. Zion 6 finds Manish my Rampage going to be the next target. He's slowed in the lurking in the waters, and Beltway drowns him. Rampage is out of there. Two quick kills for Nocturne's gaming. Nocturne's just won that fight handedly without the use of a Kraken. It was used earlier on where Rampage had to use that Aegis, which allowed that lurking in the water to do all of the cleanup, taking out the Acne. No more firebombs to come from a distance, and an early 14-minute goal fury for Nocturne's. Well, that means now the gold lead is going to start being as big a problem as the experience lead 7400 experience and 4800 gold now for nocturnes gaming to go along with their 6-2 kill lead nocturnes have played so well they get the pressure on rampage in mid yes it costs the the, the the kraken but they realize that that opens up for them to go start forcing the gold fury and masha boys were just not in position to really handle that kind of pressure they weren't all grouped up at the same time to bail each other out there and without a lot of these 
defensive items here from Anishima finishing off his hardwood amulet just now. He is a sitting duck. He's two levels behind Noitu Lover and sitting on a lot of gold in hand still. 3,000 to be exact. Noitu Lover really needs to go back and finish off that gauntlet of Thebes. Yeah, that's gonna be a it's gonna be big for him when he can finally get that stacking started up. Another problem though, I feel like for Masha Boys in that fight, they got really funneled in between the mid lane, the jungle, I feel like, on their way out. And even though Adir didn't have the ultimate, he did have the Whirlpool Kraken again. Doesn't quite find Rampage, does get some damage on the edge, but Beltway's here to try and finish the job off. Stygian Torment forces him back, but the pluck brings him back towards everyone else, but the rest of Nocturnes not really looking to fight. Instead, they want a Rampage under the tier one tower. Ace Seol is here to force him back. Mystic Rush is used defensively. The second swipe, the shell is going to buy him a moment just for now. Paralyzing spit from a distance. Bill is about to transform, but he's getting slowed by the lurking Perfect in the ball. water. Perfect stun, but it's not enough. Bill HK now is the one that's in trouble. He may have found a kill, but he'll pay for it with his life. One for one, jungle for solo laner. Rampage just barely making it out with one HP, it seems like, on the backside. And Nocturne's gaming aren't done. Flux and Minishima right back into the whirlpool. No jumping for you, Zion. Six. Takes down Minishima, and now they're looking for the Pyro Mix. A two for one at the end of the day, and despite Smatero falling there, the better objective here. Nocturne's Gaming gonna get the Pyromancer as a result. And I like the way he engaged that tower. He held on to his Mystic Rush to use to escape from the nick of danger. I think he believed that his teammates will be able to clean up this 1% health Agni that didn't have a dash anymore, but either way, they tried to help him instead for good reason, too, with the shell, with Terra right around the corner, with that uh, Earth. They're able to really just save him, but not enough there because of all the damage from this Kamazot that's building so offensive. A lot of the times you'll see a mixed build here sure. from these junglers where they go for some physical defense, whereas Matera going for the Masamune, but not... ASU here going for the Crusher. Now probably going for more cooldown reduction with Yoden's Wrath. No, my man is trying to get some damage. Is this Kamazot's pick for them? Another, you talked about how Smite was able to survive for a while. That did at least force Bill HK to overcommit. So that's why they're able to get that return kill. But how big has Beltway been for this Nocturne's roster? Finding the plucks on this Sobek. Mashi Boys have really still feeling that early start that let Beltway get big early on. And he has played this lead perfectly. Finding that second pick opened up for them the Pyromancer. Now they have an even larger lead for themselves and can create even more problems for Mashi Boys. It's just so unfortunate for Mashu the fact that they lost their first set yesterday yesterday because of the Sobek pick, right? They didn't have the pressure that they really needed to. And now they're losing because of the Sobek <laughs> pick because they didn't put the pressure on the Sobek. They uh, put themselves in an awkward position where they lost two members very early on and Nocturnes just continue to apply the quick and steady burn onto the solo lane. And this is where Sobeks get really dangerous. The 30% cooldown reduction, they can consistently look for those plucks. Wow, the Whirlpool forces in response from ASO, the bat out of hell. And I think I get why. The ultimate from Adair is available totally, and maybe he was worried that Kraken was coming. So just by getting some good damage, they force out a big ultimate. Well, the thing is, you could definitely react to the Kraken by using your own bat out of hell before the knockup actually applies. Now the Kraken's going to come through, hitting two, forcing the Aegis out of Rampage. Village K is looking for more, though. He's going to go in and find the root. Rampage has the bombs with some Anishima, who I think is okay with it. Look for the pluck did Beltway onto Rampage. That's enough to get the beads off of the mid lane Agni and make him even less safe. No beads or Aegis for Rampage now. Going to be a good target here for Smatero, whose blink is available. It's a five on one against Bill. He gets plucked into no man's land. First victim for this engagement. Beltway and these plucks, man, they've been dirty all game long. Tier one tower comes crumbling down. Beltway can't find that one, but ACL does have to back off. Jumping in is Manishima. He wants the Stygian Torment to try and bring everyone back in. It does at least bring Noitu Lover underneath the Tier 1 tower, but Smitero uses this to go into the back line and force Rampage away. Adair finishes it off while Betway finds Manishima. ACL is going to be the next target as Zion 6 hunts him down. Tier 2 tower still stands while they go looking for blood. Rampage Gaming takes down four members in total. And instantly he's transitioning their efforts. Instead of getting this Tier 2 mid tower, which is guaranteed, they can get it later once they secure the Fire Giant. It's only Kamiro left alive without the mounted archery. No potential to really steal this over the burst damage from Aider Holder. And it's just too much that Beltway is able to do for this team in the, in the front line. Even when he doesn't hit the, hit the picks, he is creating enough space. 
and, 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 and when he does find those plugs, he's able to pull them back in. Then Adair is there with that cripple field. No way for anyone to get out of it. And the damage is too strong. He, he finds the plug onto Bill HK, instant kill. And then he forces the devour jump from Kamazot, right. which actually, without that jump and without the ultimate, because it was used on the Phantom Kraken that was never really deployed, there was no escape from ASU, and he was the second victim. It was just clean pickings for Nocturnes Gaming one by one by one. The control combined with not only Bellway, but then you mentioned Noitu Lover here between the roots and the stunt. It really just amplifies things collectively for Aider Holter to lock them in place with this gem of isolation whirlpool, which is not very common in competitive play. God, so little fun is going to be had with a Poseidon Whirlpool oh, yeah. gem of isolation in it, isn't it? Nocturnes are able to take the Gold Fury even with Mashu Boys here. They weren't able to contest that one. I do also want to point out, Minishima goes in for a good Stygian Torment, but Smitero punishes perfectly, and ACO might be the one that feels a little bit more punishment, forces the bat out of hell, actually goes for damage in return, but Beltway's going to be right here for him when he lands. Not even needed, Mystic Rush from Smitero punches him down. And he couldn't really get the blink off there because I believe he clipped somebody on that third swoop. If he actually purposely canceled it or missed the third swoop, he would have then been able to blink before any sort of damage had been applied, and I think he would have been out there. I don't even have time to give Smitero credit for his last play before he makes another great play later on. He was the one that dove underneath the Tier 2 tower after Manishima's engagement, and that helped set up a bunch of kill for them too. Now with the 5v4, they're ready to start pressuring onto the Phoenix. They pull back in, Bill HK right into the crack, and he is able to jump out, but he's very low. Won't be seeing him for a little while. Mini Wave is here. That'll give him another chance to push in. Definitely needed to use that ultimate for that CC immunity just to get out of range of that Whirlpool cripple. Now it's ramp that gets plugged into Danger Zone. It's a five on four. This mid Phoenix already collapsing. Rampage didn't even get to land from the pluck before he died. A Soul is going to be following a very similar path. 5v3 now, make it a 5v2. Minishima falls, double kill for Zion 6. And Nocturne's Gaming, they were just as strong as we thought they were. They're coming into the Titan Room, and they've got a chance to end. Only Bill HK and Kamiru here to defend, but I think it's just too much damage. Nocturne's Gaming want to take game one. And they will do so tight in that 10% health. There goes the airstrike, and there goes the game. 16 to 4, 22 minutes of play. Nocturne's gaming looks so clean in that game. I mean, I, I tried to give credit there to Smitero, to, to, Bass, uh, to Beltway, to Zion6, but everyone on that roster played so clean, and I feel like they took that early lead they were given totally and just stretched it across the whole game. They definitely did, and they eventually got caught out for it as well, giving back two sure. kills to Masha <laughs> boys, but they weren't deterred in all of their efforts. They still found ways to extend it with a goal, Fury, making sure that they would find some of these picks where they control between the Terra and the Sobic. Great first pick from Mosh, uh, yeah. from Nocturnes. I don't expect Mashu boys to let this go through in the second game. In this best of three, you can make a lot of adaptations and changes here, and I'm expecting maybe that Mashu boys will take that first pick for themselves. I wouldn't be surprised if they do, but who is your MVP in game one? Certainly wouldn't fault you for picking Beltway. Zion 6 had a ton of damage, too, so my tarot looks so I'd excellent. I'd say Smitero, yeah. yeah. So there's a ton of great selections for you there in the chat. Totally is feeling Smitero. We'll see what you all think, but let's actually see what the desk thinks as they break down game one. Well, for me, that was a SPL level caliber play from Nocturnes. Honestly, that looked like they could have been in the SPL, like at least maybe five or six in the SPL easily it, with it, how that performance was. It really did feel like they were super on pacing in comparison to what we saw yesterday from a lot of the NA and EU SPL teams. Right in between that 17 to 22 minute margin, most of our NA and EU teams were starting to secure the Fire Giant and exactly. the like. And that's what it felt like from Nocturnes the entire way through. I love the amount of control that they were able to show with this composition. They clearly knew and felt very comfortable with executing. And I think that's the most important part, was just how strong their execution was. And for me, I think that personally, Beltway really stuck out here. Beltway, for me, it was Smiter. I mean, he, on the Raven, there were six kills in the game. He was 3-0-3 three, three at the start of that. And then also, the, I mean, they had a 5K gold lead at 15 minutes with one gold fury under the belt. That was a really good performance. And I think that's why I have to credit Beltway so much, because throughout the entirety of the laning phase, he had so much control on the Sobek against the Kakolin. That's not necessarily your everyday 
same matchup, the sure. Guardian into the Warrior. What did you make of that first sometimes. blood, though? It was. It was, a, it was an, a first blood, and I think that that did play a lot into it. But Smithero was able to play off of Beltway so well in the solo lane and continue to kind of build onto his lead. I think that that was one of the primary reasons why Nocturnes were able to have so much rotational ability. Well, Smithero will be... How do you say his name? You say it better than me. Smithero. There you go. He is MVP for that game one. Good performance on the Raven from the outset. Getting himself some nice kills and happy to dive under the tower. The one thing that I'm looking at here, though, Ta Taco, is the composition from Nocturnes, right? They got Raven, Sobek, and Terra as their first three picks. And I believe they're the ones that banned away Nemesis. Like, how do you deal with that front line if there's no Nemesis available? What's the next go-to in that situation? I, I think that that's where um, Mashu Boys really started to struggle, was that they didn't really have a response. They were kind of looking more so towards the early game. Sure. And we saw some strong responses. There were a couple of picks that happened shortly after that initial uh, double kill for the first one. And I, I think that there is definitely a lot of potential to be had there for Mashu Boys. These kind of land experiences are exactly what they need to kind yeah. of move forward. You can still tell that some of the land nerves, I think, are taking place at times. I mean, they did seem pretty nervous in the interview, even. And that was only a couple of their players. Plus, you mentioned the uh, substitute issues that they have going on as well. So that's always bound to be a factor as well. But uh, going back to Nocturnes and, and the way that their draft pretty much broke down, I loved seeing uh, it was either a Terra Root into the Poseidon Whirlpool, which we yeah. followed up by the Jingwei knockup, or a Sobek Plug, Sobek Tail Whip, well, so much control. There was that mid lane play where we almost saw Smitero escape on the Raven, where his whole team peeled from the Sobek peeled from, the Terra Walls came through as well. In the end, it went one for one, so it wasn't doom and gloom for Nocturnes. Mashu